Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome. I guess we'll call this the late, late show. It's 1130. Here I am. I have been busy all day between putting out a mega series episode and then going back and watching this and doing a million things in between. But I just got finished with the testimony. It was a very interesting day. In this case, I would say maybe one of the most interesting so far. Uh, Before we get started, big thank you to all the new Patreon Perk subscribers. Uh, We had quite a few join today. And also, song fact of the day, DJ Event Planner says the most requested song to be played at events is September by Earth, Wind & Fire. And I will tell you, I was born on September 21st, so... Do you remember the 21st night of September? We always laugh and say my mom does because I was born that night. And also, I came so fast, she didn't have time for anesthesia. So she definitely remembers the 21st night of September. All right, so we're going to jump right in because there is a lot to cover. And the day started with the cross-exam of Chelsea Robinson, or the continuation, I believe. Uh, She is the mother of Frankie's oldest son, who was there in the house when Frankie and Hannah Hazel were murdered. And ultimately, I think the the thick of it was that she said George and Frankie were friends until Hannah May had tried to get her to kind of be friends with George. And Frankie cut off communication with George after this and also told Chelsea not to talk to George. So the next witness was Jeff Tackett, and he opted out of being recorded audio and video. I hear he was quite the entertaining witness at times um i wish i could have seen the cross because i hear he kind of fired back with uh with that cross exam but it's kind of random the order this goes in just because um i have to give a big big shout out to big e uh chasing paper 89 on twitter he's been sitting in every day and so whenever a witness doesn't opt in to be recorded he'll shoot me the notes and lets me kind of feel like I was there, got to listen. So thanks, Biggie. He's a great guy. Go follow him. And uh, yeah, he's a good dude. So Jeff and Billy were really close. They met as teenagers and Billy called him a brother from another mother. And Jeff worked at Flying W Farms, which we know as Frederica Wagner's, doing odds and ends. And he said Frederica was definitely the boss of that farm and she was super successful. Billy, his sister Robin, and his parents lived on the farm at the time that this, uh, right before the murders happened, as we know, because they said that one thing that stood out to them was the fact that Billy's phone spent the night at the Peterson Road address for the first time in a very long time. So he knew Jake and George since they were in diapers, and he had watched them grow up. But he did say the Wagner family, as we've heard in the past, was like a cult always together, super close. Uh, The boys were homeschooled by Angela. He said Angela and Billy had a really rocky relationship. And at one point, Angela just packed his clothes and threw him out when they were living on Peterson Road. She was definitely closer to the boys than Billy was, according to Jeff. He did meet Chris Sr. at Billy's house because Chris Sr. wanted to get into the chicken fighting business. And Jeff was in the chicken fighting business himself. Apparently, there's a lot of money to be made in this business. And I know that was a, a source of, uh, I guess, some some entertainment in the courtroom today. Apparently, some of the jurors were smiling and sort of got tickled with this guy. He said he and Billy hunted together on the Flying W property. He said Billy was a great hunter. And at one hunting trip, Billy killed a 10-point buck. And George got so mad that he didn't get to kill it that he went home. Mm, like a baby. Chris Sr., his kids, Jeff, Billy, Kenneth, they all would go to chicken fights together. He had seen George's wife, Tabitha, a few times, but didn't really know her well. And he did say that Kenneth and Chris Sr. were like brothers. He had bought marijuana from Chris Sr. for personal use. And he said Chris Sr. and Billy were so close that at one point they cut their fingers and pressed them together and became blood brothers. So... But when Jake and Hannah Mae started dating, Jeff warned Chris Sr., if you had trouble with the Wagners, they would either hurt you or kill you. And that's very um, foreshadowing, for sure. 
But guys, get this. Okay, I, look, what a moron. Billy had a pocket sewn into a jacket, and he would shoplift. Okay, you know where he would shoplift? At the dollar store. Who shoplifts at the dollar store? I guess maybe because it's like a misdemeanor if you get caught because it's not, not worth a lot. But still, Jeff said it made him and Chris Sr. super uncomfortable when they were with him. Billy had told Jeff that he had gone to Mexico at one point and killed a bunch of people as well. Billy told him that Jake and George burned down a house with a turkey baster and also that they had burned down a second residence and they had collected $250,000 in insurance money from these, these fires they set. At one point, Billy was illegally selling a tractor full of rocky boots at the fairgrounds and he and Angela were arrested, both of them. And he told Jeff Angela would never snitch on him. Well, that didn't age well, did it? <laughs> Not at all. At this point, they were still living at that Bethel Hill address when that happened. So also, uh, Chris Sr. was at that Bethel Hill house when it burned down and actually was the one that called 911. He had been to Frankie and Kenneth once and he had been to Chris Sr.'s a lot. And he said that Chris Sr.'s dogs were mean. He said Billy liked pain pills, mainly Percocets, and would get them from his mom because on her property or right near her property, she owned a group home for adults with um, severe mental challenges. And I guess she was able to keep him drugged up. Jeff said he was one of the few that was allowed into the Flying W house, and Billy actually wanted him to move in after the death of his father, but Jeff didn't move in. And about a week before the murders, Billy threw his hip out, get this, while stealing semi-truck parts with Jake and George. I mean, talk about like bonding activities with your sons. Nothing like, you know, grand theft. He asked Jeff to come help him get it back into place. And apparently his sister Robin just let Jeff come into his bedroom. And so Billy was super upset with Robin because Jeff came in and saw a Billy Club uh, 22 caliber Hornet gun, full metal jacket, a vest and a holster, and 30 round clips. Jeff said he was incredibly nervous seeing all this stuff. And he said, Billy, you're going to kill somebody. He said he didn't know who, and Billy didn't tell him. Billy also said he had ordered a brass catcher. So he learned of the murders on TV, and he actually called law enforcement a couple of days later. He said at one point, Billy showed up at his house crying and super upset, saying he couldn't stand himself. But he also said Skib Montgomery, some dude named Skib Montgomery, who I don't think we've ever had any proof this guy was ever involved in anything, ever, not even drugs. He said Skib Montgomery did it because he was cut out of a $2,000 or a 2,000 pound marijuana deal. But Jeff said he knew it was Billy. So on cross, Parker wanted to know about these chicken fights. And Jeff said Billy asked him to go with him once to Mexico. This was after the murders, actually. But he didn't go. And when he asked how much you could make with the chicken fights, he said he saw someone in Oklahoma make half a million dollars. And during that fight, some guy must have died. And so these other fighters were throwing, like, money, $14,000 into this pit to pay for this guy's funeral. He said they're generous people. Um, he said Billy owed Chris Sr. $40,000 and that $20,000 Chris Sr. was holding of Billy's was taken by law enforcement after the murder. Now, here's the thing. Jeff worked for BCI and wore a wire for them to try to get something out of Billy confession-wise about the murders. Uh, but when he went to the Peterson Road address, which was four or five times, Billy just gave him the cold sh shoulder, and he was paid $100 each time he wore that wire, which if you think about it, that's, that's a really bad deal for, you know, what if they would have found out he was wired? I, I don't know. I mean, these people, they're crazy. When asked about the arson, Jeff said law enforcement was told Jake and George had tried to deep fry a turkey, and that's what caught the house on fire. He said Chris Sr., from what he understood, had about 2,000 pounds of Mexican marijuana coming in. He said Billy was the absolute craziest guy he knew and that Chris spent a lot of time at Billy's. And Jeff thought it was possible Chris Sr. may have had something going on with Angela. It's the first I've ever heard of that. 
At one point, Billy had divorce papers drawn up and he said Angela nagged him constantly. I mean, I could totally see that. You see how controlling she is with the boys and you're going to hear a lot more of that with the next two witnesses. But um, he didn't go to law enforcement before the murders because he was in fear of his life. So um, and Jeanette let, uh, Levy from Law and Crime said he seemed nervous except for when he was talking about the chicken fighting and he made some of the jurors smile with his testimony. So the next witness was Samantha Staley. And I'm going to tell you, she she was shaking. I thought she was shaking just like her body. But Big E said she was shaking her leg the whole time. Um, her dad worked for Frederica on the Flying W Farms. And I have to tell you, this, I don't know that, okay, first of all, this girl's sweet as pie. She is just super genuine, and you can tell she's got a really good heart. But I wondered why she's testifying for the prosecution, because it was really pro-George in most ways. It, 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 I mean, you can tell she still cares about George, and um, but I think two things that, that I found throughout this testimony that maybe was the reason the prosecution called was that number one, George was different after the murders and she was able to testify to the very super controlling nature that Jake and Angela had about Sophia, which kind of lays that foundation for the murders because otherwise y'all, um, she, I thought it, I thought it, I thought her testimony sort of humanized George in a way. And all right, so here we go. She hung out with Jake and George both from around the time she was young. She said knee high to a grasshopper, which is a Southern saying. We say that around here. And she said then it would get to where she would see him randomly. Sometimes she may go a few years without seeing him. But she would go to Flying W Farms with her dad. And they moved around as a bit when she was a kid. So she said she was around the age of 12 when she really remembers hanging out with them. They would ride four-wheelers, or if she was hanging out with Jake, they would jump on the trampoline. And at this point, that's when the Wagners lived on Bethel Hill Road, or Bethel Hill. She also knew Jake and George were homeschooled, and she said Angela or one of the boys gave her what she calls a cheat sheet, which is like a book she used to check their grades. So I'm guessing maybe it had the answers in it. Billy was a friend of her dad's, and she reached out to the Wagners back in 2013 when her dad had a stroke and a brain bleed. So she just looked Angela up online on Facebook and inboxed her to let Billy know that her dad was sick. And uh, they weren't friends on Facebook. She just randomly searched. And her dad survived, but Billy showed up at the house asking how her dad was doing and if they needed anything. And she said the trailer they were living in th at that point was just really in bad shape the floors were caving in and so billy offered to buy plywood to rebuild it so they could bring her dad home with the hospital bed he needed and billy also bought bought both her and her mom some hygiene products she said frederica helped pay their utilities so they could keep the power on to bring her dad home so in 2014 this uh, samantha had her first child and in 2015 she got married and that holiday season, not too long after, you know, her baby was about one, um, she was kind of just venting to George about not being able to buy Christmas for her kid. And she was just really struggling to, to pay basic bills. So she said George met up with her and bought gifts for her kid. And also um, she met, met him at a store to get the Christmas presents. And he gave her an envelope with a Christmas card that had money in it. She said she did not have great interactions with Angela, and she said she's one of a kind, very quiet, and she said observant. And she didn't feel welcomed at all by Angela when she was around her. She said the boys would have to hide the fact they were in contact with her from Angela, and Billy also didn't want her to tell Angela that that he had helped her family. So you, you just... But see, here's the thing with me, and I'm just like, okay, we're into week four okay and i think i'm on day 15 twice here because i mistakenly put it last week i think this is actually day 15 but i have to say right now and i'm sure that they have goods because they've charged him with a lot of murders with death on the table until jake confessed but i haven't heard anything yet that super implicates george 
other than, you know, um, there's no DNA. There's a, I'm just saying, so I'm not saying he's innocent. I'm just saying that we're four weeks in and all I've heard about is Jake and Angela and Billy really. So I, I hope they're saving kind of the, the best part, not the best part, but the most incriminating part for last, right before the defense takes over, because really maybe this is all foundation laying because nothing so far as I've, I've, I've not had an aha moment and said, ah, there there's where he fits in other than Jake's word. So anyways, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, she said the family was super close. If one had an opinion, they all had that opinion. And one couldn't do something without the other knowing. She said she thought if Angela said something needed to be done, they'd do it. She said around 2012, actually, uh, Jake. Oh, okay. Sorry. That just scared me. So my dogs have this automatic water thing that, you know, you fill it up. It's like a gallon and it just made some kind of funky noise. And it's late, y'all. Everybody's asleep in here but me. Um. So Jake called and said he did not know how to be intimate with a woman and asked if she could help him out with it. And she said she was young and stupid and said yes, and they did what they did. So when asked if she liked Jake or George better, she said it was kind of a hit and miss question. She said she was pushed towards Jake by both Angela and her mom from when she was little, but she said her and George had more of an emotional mental bond. She didn't know they moved from Bethel Hill to Peterson until she got a car finally in May 6, 2016. She called George to tell him about her new car, and they started cracking jokes. He wanted to know, oh, yeah, you got some new wheels. Is it like an ATV? And she wanted to show him. So she said, I'll come by your house. So he told her they moved and gave her that Peterson Road address. Well, when she got there, she kind of felt like she was being rushed. Now, her husband was with her on his four-wheeler, and George was kind of looking back at the house, almost like he was expecting somebody to come outside. And she said they were actually towards the end of the driveway, but Angela was constantly looking out the window. She said they were there not quite an hour, and then they left. George told her they moved because his grandma sold the property from underneath them. The defense objected before she could answer. And poor thing, she looked scared to death the first time that there was an objection. She looked like she didn't know what to do. She knew the rodents. She knew Chris Sr., Dana, Frankie, Hannah Mann, little Chris, because she went to school with Frankie and also dated him from the middle of seventh grade to about the end of the ninth grade. She had been to Chris Sr.'s home and what was Frankie's mom's house which eventually became the house he and Hannah Hazel were killed in. Um, he had, she had been to both those properties, but she said actually that Frankie stayed more with his dad and that little Chris and Hannah Mae stayed with Dana. She said Hannah Mae and little Chris were wild ones, <laughs> but they were all friendly together. And she told a story about accidentally hitting Hannah Mae in the chin with a softball and Hannah Mae was bleeding everywhere. And she said right before her and Frankie broke up, she got in trouble. She didn't elaborate, but she wasn't allowed to hang out with Frankie anymore. So she said she conned George to hang out with her and they picked Frankie up and went fishing. And she said the three of them ended up sleeping in a shack together on Bethel Hill. She said hers and Frankie's breakup wasn't bad at all. She didn't stay in touch with any of the rodents, but they were always friendly if they saw each other out. She said it was just, you know, that high school thing where... You know, you date in middle school, get to high school, realize, okay, well, learned a few things, but time to move on. She found out Frankie had gotten his girlfriend pregnant, and she said she was super happy for him. She had seen him at a gas station, and he told her, and he was just so excited he was going to be a dad. She eventually stopped going to public school due to an injury, I think she said in track, and she started homeschooling. And she would randomly see Frankie out, and they were always friendly and would speak when they ran into each other. She found out the Rodens and the Wagners knew each other, and it took her aback because she knew both families for a very long time but didn't know that they knew each other. So a couple of months after her and Jake were intimate, he told her he was getting together with Hannah Mae, and she asked how they met, and Jake said that the whole families go way back. So when asked if Jake and Frankie had, a, had any bad blood... She said George had told her Frankie and Jake had gotten into it because Jake had punched Hannah May, and Frankie was defending his sister. 
She also shared with Jake she had been molested as a child <clears throat> and they were in his truck when she told told him that. That's going to come in on in a little bit, the rest of that story. She never saw Billy and Chris Sr. together. And so kind of jumping ahead to where Hannah Mae has her baby, uh, she asked her to babysit Sophia a couple of times for a few hours saying she needed a minute to breathe. They need to remember Hannah Mae's so young. I think maybe if, if Sophia is one and a half, then Hannah Mae's 16. And at that point, Samantha had her own child too. But when Jake found out that Samantha was babysitting Sophia, Jake got in contact with her. She said he was asking 999 questions like, did Hannah Mae bring a diaper bag? Has she seen Hannah Mae? Now, she did acknowledge uh, Corey Holdren lived near her, and she actually lived on Corey Holdren's grandmother's property. So he lived just kind of around the corner from her. Um, Jake told her he wanted information for a custody battle. So she talked on the phone with him and told him it doesn't matter how much money he had, and Ohio is super hard to get custody away from the mom saying she's unfit. She said Hannah Mae definitely was not an unfit mother, but Jake asked her to be a spy for Sophia's sake. So Jake contacted Samantha's mom, and I believe Angela did too, asking her to do the same, to spy and let them know of anything that would help them in their custody battle that you know they thought was upcoming. Um, she just told him she wouldn't do that and that she wasn't going to watch Sophia anymore because she just felt like he was putting her in a bad situation. And when asked how close to the murders this was, she just really wasn't sure. She couldn't put her finger on this time frame. But if Sophia's one and a half, uh, you know, it's, it's probably still a couple of years, I think, before the murder. Um, it kind of... Um, broke up her and Hannah Mae's. She she just kind of stopped contact with both of them just to not be in the middle. And she saw Hannah Mae actually the day before she was murdered. Hannah Mae drove by and honked her horn and Samantha came out of her house and said she wanted to see baby Kylie because at that point, um, Hannah Mae had her four days earlier. We know Hannah Mae was murdered when Kylie was five days old. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Hannah Mae said she would be back. And she said she never came back, obviously. So the next day, her mom said, you're not going to believe this. Turn on the TV. So she turned it on and saw they had all been murdered. She called her husband at work and told him to come home. And she said Frankie was the first boy she loved. And it was a lot of trauma at one time. She really does smile every time she talked about Frankie. You can tell it was very pleasant memories and um, a lot of hurt with the trauma that, um, that, that she felt after the whole family was murdered. But after the murder, she did go fishing with George and her husband, and she said it was within a month of those murders. And during that fishing trip, she said he just wasn't the same George she knew. She said he looked sad, lost. He looked dead inside, and he didn't have the crooked smile he always had. And, you know, you can really see the pain in her eyes. Um, in fact, one thing about George I noticed, when she was testifying, normally if you watch this trial live, George always kind of has the same um, <clears throat> expression on his face. And it's kind of just, um, he looks mad. But when she was testifying, now, y'all don't start attacking me as a George supporter because I'm not. But I'm just saying, it was the first time that I ever saw George just almost looking remorseful or sort of ashamed or I don't know the word I'm looking for. But there was a difference in him when Samantha was on the stand. I think maybe she was just somebody he enjoyed being with. And, you know, it, you could tell it really, really pained her. And she said he was always bubbly. And it confused her. She said he almost looked like he had lost his pet or his best friend. That night while fishing, they were going to stay all night, but it started lightning. And George said, I don't fish in the lightning. So she said Frankie just popped up in her mind and she explains that when she gets nervous or stressed out, she kind of rambles. And she's, <clears throat> excuse me, all Lord have mercy. She says when she, my lung went that way. She said when she's nervous, she rambles. And she said, can you believe this? They're gone. They're never coming back. And she said she was pretty much told by George to shut the F up. And she had seen George just a few days prior 
and this was after the murders, but she said it was dark and she couldn't really see him well, but he did seem nervous at that time too. So after the Wagners moved to Alaska, she kept in touch with George. She was telling him, hey, look, all social media outlets are saying y'all did this and this is why you ran. And she said that George told her there's no way we all could have been there. Somebody had to be home with the kids. Well, Angela was. She told him that she had his back. And she told people they were going to mechanic school and was telling them that he was just living his dream, not knowing they already had their schooling or their CDL license or whatever it was. And this is somebody that's going to come in later. This was randomly thrown in, and I had to text Biggie to ask him. Um, the prosecutor asked if he ever talked about Vance Walls to her, and she said no. Apparently, Vance is somebody who was dealing marijuana who will later be testifying in the trial. So the prosecution brings in these text messages between her and Jake. And Jake says, you've met Sophie? And Sam says, I babysit her, silly. Don't tell Hannah Mae I wasn't supposed to say anything. Jake said, what reason do you babysit her for? Because Sophia isn't supposed to be babysat by anyone besides my mom and Hannah's mom. Jake said, if you have time, call me. Sam said, I tried to call you. Jake said, didn't come through. Jake said, hey, Sam, I got another question. Does Hannah give you a diaper bag or a care bag, food, drinks, anything when she drops her off? Sam uh, Samantha says, did you guys call my mom? Please be honest. Jake said, no. Why? I don't know her number. Sam said, are you around your brother? And Jake said, yeah, well, almost. He's downstairs, but I can run down if you want, LOL. And so the prosecutor asked, like, why were you wanting to know where George was? And she said, I was just want to know what he's doing. She's adorable, y'all. She really is sweet. Um, I, I think she, she, um, yeah, it's, it's hard, you know, because for her, um, she only has good memories of George. And to have to stand up or sit up there for hours, it was a couple of hours, I believe, and testify against him, um, her nerves were apparent. And I know it was hard on her. Uh, Sam says, no, that's okay. I can't watch her anymore due to threats. She said she put treats in there, but she meant threats. She said that because she found out they, and by they, I, I assume she means Angela and Jake had called her mom and also asked them to, um, she, Angela had called from Jake's phone asking the same questions, apparently. Jake said, can you text me everything we talked about because I'm going to use that against Hannah when I take her to court after her baby's born. Samantha said, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Jake, but I'm no longer going to watch her. There's way too much going on, too much drama to the point it's getting bad on my part, and to the point someone keeps calling my mother. I'm sorry. Jake said, well, Sam, I'm not mad at you, but if Sophie calls you mommy, it's because Hannah's not even raising her. You are. If you do watch Sophie, just let me know that you do, okay? I don't want to get you involved more than you are. Just be a spy for Sophie's sake. She said every bit of that drama came from Jake and Angela. George didn't reach out to her on her or her mother to her or her mother, to her knowledge. She said she stopped talking to Hannah Mae also because she just didn't want any part of it. She said she had her own life and her own drama. Um, and we said the next time she saw her was the day before she was murdered. She asked who brought Jake and Georgia, who bought Jake and George's clothes. And she said she didn't know. She said they mostly wore Carhartt. Jake wore American Eagle and Air Apostle and, always boots. She said she never saw the boys in a pair of sneakers ever. And she never saw them in Walmart clothes. Angela asked, um, the prosecutor asked, did you ever see them in cheap clothes? And um, she said, no. She said, Jake had a habit of tattletaling. George wasn't so much a tattletale like his brother. She said, sometimes it was normal brother things like mom, Jake did this, mom, George did that. So on cross, she was the cross, like the defense dream to cross examine because her testimony was just very much um, her recollection of George. And, you know, I think the one thing that can be said for Samantha is she hasn't let what's been said all over the news and the accusations affect her memories of George. And I, so she, she got the easiest cross I've seen in four weeks. So the defense says, you grew up with George from a young age, yes. And then the defense asks, has your dad recovered? And she goes through and says, you know, he's still partially paralyzed. 
apparently has problems with his memory. He may tell you a story that happened 30 years ago and tell you it happened yesterday, that kind of thing. So the defense asked, how would you describe George when he was young? And she said he was bubbly, really fun to be around. And then they asked, was he shy? And she said, it depends. She said, if he was doing what I'm doing right now, meaning being up on that stand, he would shut down and he wouldn't talk. Um, the defense says George didn't have a lot of friends growing up on Bethel Hill. And she said, no. And then the defense says Jake and George were different personalities. And she said, yes. The defense says, was Jake a mama's boy? And yes. She said, in my opinion, George would go out and do his own thing. Jake would have to get Angela's opinion before he did anything. And if she didn't approve, he wouldn't do it. George kind of did his own thing. And then the defense said, you felt like your mom and Angela were pushing you to be with Jake and you didn't care for that. And she said, no. The defense said you were more attracted to George as time went on. And she said, he made me feel like I was wanted, honestly. And I thought that was pretty profound because that does make a person feel more sentimental than, you know, maybe if she were testifying about Jake. Um, and I, she's in the process of getting divorced. So um, I thought that was a very profound statement, though. He made me feel like I was wanted. The defense says he was nice to you and that continued into adulthood. And he even brought toys for your kids and gave you cash. And she said, yes. The defense says if you needed something, who would you call? And she said, the boys. The defense said, and George would come running. And she said, yes. If not George, they both would come. The defense says George wasn't shy around you, but maybe shy around others. And she said, yes. The defense says as he got older and got a driver's license, did he change? And she said at that point, they really weren't hanging out much. She, she couldn't say. So the defense asked, was Frankie your first boyfriend? And she said, yes. And she gave the biggest smile when she said yes. She said, uh, the defense said George would hang out with Frankie. And she said, I didn't know they knew each other, but we did a couple of times. And the defense is really like pushing this whole Frankie and George were best friend theory with a lot of people. And then the hunting and there's some things that in the 4th of July thing, there's, I've got a list over there of things that have been repeatedly said, but we have no context of why they're important. Um, but it says you found out George and Frankie hung out and she said, yeah, I thought they got close because Jake and Hannah were dating, but I found out they'd actually known each other a long time before that. So the defense asked your relationship with Angela. What did you think of Angela as far as your relationship with her? And Samantha said she felt very uneasy around her and never felt welcome in her presence. Uh, she said, I felt she thought I would take one of the boys from her and she would keep them close. She said, I went to Jake's room. Angela didn't like it. The doors were open. Nothing was going on. The defense said she liked to main maintain control. And she said, yes. The defense says, did you date, date Jake for a time? She said, we were dating, but it wasn't a thing. And the defense says it was more Jake and Angela, like wanting that, I guess. And she said, yes. And then the defense asked what happened in his truck. And she says, I let him know I was molested at a young age. I shared that with him and she got really teary and you could tell just immediately it flooded back. Bless her heart. I wanted to hug her and she just kind of put her finger up like, I, you know, I need a minute. And he was very respectful of the defense attorney was super respectful of that. Um, and so she, she composes herself and Jake said, where does he live? I'll go kill him. And she said, I saw a very different Jake that day. He was scary and it was surprising to her. She said, Jake was always too good for you and um, always acted that way. But she said when he made that comment, she was ready to go home. And she said she didn't talk the whole ride home. So the defense asked, you and George had a good relationship. You trusted him. He helped you when you were down. And she said, yes. Defense says Jake was a jealous person. And she said, yeah, I remember I was just starting to date Frankie and Jake showed up at my house and she just felt like he wanted to see who was there. The defense asked, do you think Angela was je jealous? And she said, I remember Billy saying Angela would accuse him of sleeping with other people a lot. The defense said, you and you go four-wheeling? And she would say, yeah, me, Jake, and George. Then she said, uh, Jake wrecked a four-wheeler. And she said, that hurt bad. I think we hit a tree. And the defense said, well, what did Jake tell Angela? 
And she said, probably a big fat lie, like it was George's fault. She said, George always got the blame. If Jake would do something, George always got the blame. The defense said, you knew George was into deer hunting. That was his passion and hobby. He would eat the deer that he killed. He would skin them and like mount their heads. And the defense says, Angela was protective of Jake. And she said, yes. The defense says, Dilly, um, Dilly. <laughs> Uh, dollar store Billy. Billy did not have a real job, and she said, not that I know of. The defense said, did you ever catch Jake staring off into the distance? Now, this got me all. I don't know where this was going. Um, and she, do you have a word? Did you have a word for that? And she said, squirrel. And the defense says, can you explain that? And she said, you know, just like you see a squirrel and say, there it goes. And she kind of looks to the side. It reminded me of Up with a dog with a collar and like he would say squirrel, you know, and he would be doing something and he would get distracted. I, I don't know why he was saying that. Like, why is it important to know that sometimes Jake daydreamed or stared off in the distance? Um, so you, the defense says you seem to think Jake was different than most guys growing up in the country. And she said, Jake just thought he was better than everybody and could get away with a lot more. And she said he was very particular about his truck. If someone had muddy shoes, or I'm sorry, if someone had muddy shoes at Angela's house and she had just vacuumed, pretty sure it was Jake, George got blamed. And then the defense says Jake had a truck that he was very particular about. And she said, you don't get in with any dirt on you. Jake and the defense said he would ask people not to get in if they were dirty and that Jake would ask people to put plastic bags on their feet if they had dirt on their shoes. And she said, yeah, he said he would do that. She said one time he was dusting her off and like picking hair off of her before she got in that truck. And the defense said, would you call it OCD? And she said, yes. So the defense said after the murder, you were, um, before the murder, you were close to Frankie and Hannah May, and George was close to both. And she said he was close to Frankie. So this is kind of what the defense wanted to get out of her. And after the murders, you call him to go fishing with your husband. That was your idea. And you know, George, you knew George was hurting. And she said, I knew there was pain. The defense says he lost a friend too. And she says, yes. So I'm sure the prosecution's over there going, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> Got a mess to clean up here. Um, the defense asked if Jake was controlling over Hannah, and she said, I got that vibe. Didn't want to be a part of it. The defense asked if you knew Chris Sr. well, and she said, no, he was really quiet. She did not know he sold marijuana or had fighting chickens. So on redirect, you know, Angela had to get up and try to clean some of this up. You said you would go some years without seeing the boys and you were surprised to know the Wagners and the Rodens knew each other. And that was towards the end of you dating Frankie. And she said, yes. So the prosecution says prior to that, when you did hang out with the boys, you never saw the Wagners and the Rodens together. And she said, no. So she's asked you, you said you conned George to go fishing so you could see Frankie. And Samantha says, yes. And the prosecution says your opinion of their friendship was based on things you were told by George. And she said, yes. Prosecutor asked, did Jake also hunt? And she said, yes. And she asked, did you know them to poach? Like, for example, hunt deer when they're not in season? And she said, no. You know they did. She said, one time you remember the ATV ride where you wrecked and, and Jake said it was George's fault. She said, George got the blame for it, like, Always. And I told Jake, own up to your own actions, but he never would. So when she said earlier that when she gets nervous, she rambles, she was serious about that. Because even on like redirect, it kind of got away from the prosecution a couple of times, I think. And it was sort of back more leading towards that defense side for me. Uh, the prosecutor said if George were to say Jake's honesty got them into trouble, like Jake would tell Angela stuff. Is that true? And she said, when it came to Angela, Jake would tell her everything. Jake's an honest person, but he loves to point fingers. Maybe a little too honest, especially when talking to Angela. And he never blamed anybody but George for anything that was wrong. The prosecutor said, you never shared with George your childhood trauma. 
And she said, I don't remember. She said, I know the look on Jake's face is a look I'll never get out of my head. The prosecutor said, you said Jake and George were sheltered. And Samantha said, I felt if Angela told Jake to go jump off a cliff, he would do it. Prosecutor said, you called the boys when you needed help. And she gave a really long story about um, her mom's van breaking down. And ultimately, she called. And someone in the background, she wasn't sure if it was Angela or Hannah Mae, told them that they needed to hurry and get back. But they had to go get a part, go meet them. They came, helped, went back home. The prosecutor said, you were asked if you trusted George when you were young. Has that changed? And she said, I don't know who to trust now. I've questioned myself almost every other day if our friendship was a lie. So the cross, more cross, Fed's got to get back up one more time, you know. The defense says, you don't know what happened that night. And she says, no, it was a tragedy. And the defense says, yes, it was a tragedy. So that was the end of Samantha's testimony. The last witness of today who we did not get finished with is Tabitha Clater. Clater. She was married to George, lived with the Wagners, and she is also the mother of uh, George's son and her oldest. I think it's Bolvine. Now she's married with three kids. They're nine, five, and four, and she works as a nursing home at housekeeper. They met through her mom, who worked for Frederica for about 10 or 15 years, and Frederica owns that group home we talked about earlier for special needs people. And she said four or five typically live there, and her mom worked in that group home. So her mom would take her to work, and she would hang out inside and um, her mom also took her to Fred Rica's and her and George rode four wheelers to his house on Bethel Hill Road, which is about 20 minutes if you take the road, but five if you go like through the woods and over the hills. It was her, George, Jake and her sister. She was about 12 years old at the time. And then they became, you know, 12 year old boyfriend and girlfriend. They continued kind of dating, I guess, movies, dinner, four wheeling, fishing, hunting. George broke it off when they were 13 and they're broken up for six years. But out of the blue, she gets an inbox from Hannah Mae on Facebook, who she doesn't know at the time. And Hannah Mae wanted to get them reconnected. So she said she was, J Hannah Mae said she was Jake's girlfriend and wanted them to get back together. George sent her a friend request and they started to talk. And around this time, she's 18, 19, a senior in high school. And he's about three years older than her at that point. So he's, you know, 21, 22. They kind of pick up where they left off. It sounds like, you know, four wheeling, fishing, hanging out with friends. And then she started living over with the Wagners after a couple of months of them dating. At that time, she was the only one living there besides the Wagner family. And she actually graduated high school while living there. Her mom didn't mind because she knew the Wagners. And um, they got married a year after they started dating. So that was July 2012. I wish I'd pulled that picture up. I have it. It's the Rodens and the Wagners at this wedding. I'll, I'll put it on tomorrow. And uh, so they got married just a couple of months after she graduated high school. She got pregnant about eight months after they got married, and their son was born in July of 2013. At this point, she's still living with the Wagners. Hannah Mae moved in when she got pregnant. And Sophia was born a few months later, but she would, Hannah Mae would go home with her mom a couple of days a week here and there. But after Hannah Mae had Sophia, she started staying more with the Wagners. Tabitha wasn't leaving like Hannah Mae because she said she just wasn't allowed to. George and his family would not let her leave. There were some objections here about this, but ultimately um, a lot of it was let in. Just they had to do a little more foundation. She thought the Wagners didn't like her family. That's part of the reason she wasn't allowed to leave. Her mom and sister visited once and once only, and them only visiting once was not her choice. It was Angela's house, Angela's rules. And George went along with what his mom requested. She said Angela's house, her rules applied to everything, whether it was cooking, cleaning, laundry, it all had to be done the way she wanted it or you'd have to redo it or she would do it herself. She lived with them a total of two years before she moved. So when her son was born, George and Angela were there. Angela spent the night at the hospital with her. George went home. She wanted her mom there, but her mom wasn't allowed there. 
So she said that kind of the daily routine while living at the Wagners, they would wake up, eat, go feed whatever animals they had, and then take care of the house. Also, if you get offended by um, like sexual stuff, you might want to skip ahead about 15, uh, 15 seconds because it's in mainstream media put just this way. I'm going to put it out there because it was actually a really hilarious moment in the courtroom. There were rules from Angela about the sexual relations her and George could engage in. And she blurts out in court. Angela said, if you give oral sex, you'll go to hell because it's a sin. Okay. The judge very quickly and loudly says, listen to the question. This is her. Okay, y'all, I'm going to put this link in the bio. But she turns around like, oops. Like her reaction to the judge. Because look, guys, this, this, ju this judge is not a spring chicken. You know, I've, I've been sure to say he's in his late 70s, right? And he and she did not use that term. She used the slang term for it. And he was like, oh, listen to the question. And she was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was it was kind of funny. So Angela's theory was that you only have intercourse to have children. She said that to her and George together, not only at the kitchen table or in the bedroom, where Angela would sit on the bed and tell them what they couldn't do. <laughs> Y'all, that is not even normal at all. She stayed in George's bedroom when she was allowed to, but towards the end of the night, every night she would have to leave so that Angela could come in and scratch George's back and ask about his day. I'm not making that up, y'all. That's how that house was. <laughs> Towards the end of the night, she would have to... Um, yeah, no, I just read that because I'm still just like, what? Um, she told George she had been sexually abused as a child by a relative only because he had found out from somebody else. I believe she said her sister had told her her boyfriend. And she was pregnant at this time. And she said George's reaction was that he was mad and he was saying he was going to go kill this guy. So she said she physically sat on him until he calmed down. This was why they didn't want the son, the baby, around her family at all. Her mom finally met her son when her son was about a year and a half old. She said her and Hannah Mae didn't get along. They were both competing for Angela's approval, and you could see how that would happen. That's like a perfect storm. That is absolutely something I would see happening. She said that she was accused by Angela of stealing $400, and she never lived up to Angela's approval. She never could do anything right because she said Angela would tell her. She lived on Bethel Hill Road when the home burned down. It did burn down, but it wasn't no accident. It was a house that was actually built around a trailer, and she knew the fire was intentional. She said before they burned it, they moved a lot of things they did not want destroyed to a house, um, that from that house to a hunting cabin on that property. Things like beds, dressers, most of their clothing, you know, their precious deer heads, and pictures, gun safes with guns, and they did that for the insurance money to burn that house down. The insurance company needed proof that what they said was in the house was actually in the house. So Angela went and bought a receipt book and they wrote a ton of receipts to make it look like those things were actually in the house. So the fire was actually set from a pan overfilled with grease on the stove. And she was there that morning, but her and Angela left that day to go shopping for her son's party. So I was thinking he was going to be a year. It was his one month party. So when they came back and Angela saw smoke, she said, oh, oh no, I hope that's not ours. <sighs> Fifty Shades of Cray, y'all. She knew Jake's truck also had caught fire and burned the garage down, but she did not know if that was intentional or not. She said they drove all over looking for a new place to live. They found Peterson Road. It was purchased and put under George and Jake's name. Their son was only allowed to sleep with Angela and Billy at night. And at that point, Hannah Mae was mostly there full time. After the Wagners were arrested, her and her son, her son got to move back in with her. And he was five at the time. Remember, the Wagners took this boy to Alaska with them. And if you remember from way back, the story that may come in tomorrow of Angela chasing her with a shotgun. Tabitha was so scared she hid on the property till dark, rode a bike down to a gas station to get help. And eventually, you know, was threatened and, and promised things that were lies to sign custody over until she could get on her feet, according to the Wagners. But this was objected to, and this kind of ended the testimony for the day. 
But essentially, what was alluded to before it was objected, she got it out. Um, her son, after he moved back in at the age of five, told her she was accused of trying to poison the Wagner family and also that she killed all of the Roden family. So that's how they ended testimony. I'm telling y'all, that was the funniest moment of the day. If you go back and watch that part, I'm telling you, the way she turns, it's like, you know, she knows this judge is a little bit older and his tone of voice was like maybe a little embarrassed. It was, I mean, it was just kind of funny. So she will be back tomorrow. They're not finished um, with her. And if you hear some weird noises, still this thing over here. Uh, she'll be back tomorrow and she was still on direct. So we still have more direct and then we'll have cross and probably recross. And so we'll see who else opts in tomorrow. I was really super surprised she opted in. I'm grateful she did. This is her story too. And uh, her son, what he endured, um, you know, was uh, unimaginable for a child that small. All right, guys, I'm out. We'll see you tomorrow for a whole other episode of the Wagner trial day. Actually, day 16, because I did 15 twice. So 16 tomorrow. Hope you have a good night. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.